Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be back lecturing in person and what a wonderful place to be. Every time I come to the Royal Institution, I learn something new and that's true because I didn't know that Faraday lived in this building on the third floor. Well, that's a better commute than I've got. And actually, we're going to talk about how I commute because I've got an electric bike, but we'll come to that later. Every time I come here, I learn something fantastic and new and so much of it is associated with the pioneers of electricity and electrochemistry and electromagnetism. And it's great to be here in person today. Thank you all so much for coming. We're going to talk about about batteries and electric motors from Galvani to Gigafactory. So we're going to start with a bit of a history lesson, thinking about the pioneering work that was done here and elsewhere. And we're really delighted that the Royal Institution have really kindly lent us some of these artefacts that we can use to illustrate some of the basic concepts of electrochemistry on which so much of our modern society relies. Before we sort of take a look forward in terms of what's going on with battery technology and where we might be in 10, 50, 100 years from now. So hopefully that journey from Galvani Galvani to Gigafactories uh, will uh, continue the pioneering work of Michael Faraday's and others from right here in this building. So, as many of you will know, this year is the bicentenary, the 200th anniversary of Faraday's discovery of the electric motor. And what a wonderful opportunity to think about the interaction between two of Faraday's great passions, electrochemistry and electromagnetism, when we think about batteries and the electric motor. And we probably don't spend long enough thinking about batteries and the electric motor because it's something that we absolutely take for granted. From the sublime to the extremely mundane, the electric motor and the battery touches so much of our modern lives. And I've got a few examples. I was trying to sort of catalogue how I use electric motors and how I use batteries in different ways. And it's obvious that we just take these things for granted. It was impossible for me to try and count the number of batteries that I used in a given day, but I managed to find a handful of examples that I've got here in front of me. So let's start with batteries and the electric motor, just with a child's toy. It's amazing how cheap, robust, ubiquitous these things are. This is a small drone. It's got four electric motors and a battery in it. This is absolutely the intersection of Michael Faraday's work on batteries and the electric motor. And the batteries that go inside that drone are a lithium-ion battery. It's about one watt-hour. So the amount of energy stored in a battery like this is about 0.91 watt-hour. So we go to something slightly larger. Another place that I use batteries and electric motors is in my vacuum cleaner. My wife's in the audience, she maybe says I don't use this often enough, I don't know, but it's certainly one way that we can use batteries and the electric motor. And this is a battery pack that stores about 10 times the amount of energy that we have powering our drone. And again, it's a lithium-ion battery that goes into that. And then finally, an even bigger battery, and this is, my, this is my bike, this is how I get to work. I like to say it's because I'm supporting the battery industry, but it's really because I'm too lazy to pedal up hills. This is an electric-powered bike where we've got a big battery in the top tube of the bike, and of course, Faraday's electric motor down here in the hub. And so just when I think about my day-to-day -day life, it's really clear that batteries and electric motors touch so much of what we do. And really, we're building on all that pioneering discoveries. Many of those were made right here in this very building to underpin modern life. It's almost impossible to think about the amount of batteries we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Every time I listen to music, I've got three lithium-ion batteries in my headphones, one in each headphone and one in the case. And again, it's a lithium-ion battery that's powering it, all the way from my tiny drone, all the way up to really, really big batteries. Ones that might power cars, one that might be partnered with a wind farm. We've got batteries that span all those scales. If you walked into the Royal Institution from Albemarle Street today, you probably went past an electric vehicle charging point. I know that when I walked past there, there was a Renault Zoe park there. Of course, that's a great example. Probably the most prominent example of how we use batteries and electric motors is in the continuing drive for the electrification of the vehicle sector. And when we think about the size of a battery that goes into an electric vehicle, like the Jaguar I-Pace that we can see here, it's about a 90 kilowatt hour battery. So that's 90,000 times larger than the battery that goes into my drone. But again, it's a lithium-ion battery. So the building blocks for the battery that goes into a 90 kilowatt hour Jaguar I-Pace or a 100 megawatt hour stationary storage battery farm, the building blocks are always the same. It's a lithium-ion battery. 
And the ubiquity of the lithium-ion battery obviously led to the award of the Nobel Prize in 2019, and we're great to celebrate that. But it also gives us pause to think about how we can maybe develop different batteries for different applications. And in the future, maybe we'll have alternative chemistries that we can effectively match make with such a broad range of applications, from the tiny batteries that go into medical implants to the enormous batteries that we're going to need for wind farms. And of course, that intersection between electric motors and batteries is absolutely critical. Um, just to give an indication of scale, it's very kind of the Warwick Manufacturing Group to lend me this battery. This is an eight kilowatt hour battery. And I talked about those sort of building blocks being exactly the same, whether we're looking at a vacuum cleaner or looking at an electric vehicle battery. And in this case, it's absolutely true because you can see that these batteries here, there's 1,100 batteries in this battery pack, are exactly the same as the battery that goes into my vacuum cleaner. They're called 18650 cells, and they are stacked up. I think there's 1,152 of them in this battery here. Um, and we can continually scale these. We can scale these from drones to hoovers to 100 megawatt hour batteries that go to wind farms. And so really, it's such a robust and impressive technology uh, that we all completely take for granted. And I wanted to close with two examples uh, from the sublime to the somewhat less sublime. As I mentioned, one of the highest profile ways that we use batteries and electric motors is in cars. And perhaps no better example than the hypercar. This is a Rimac uh, hypercar, which is a 120 kilowatt hour battery capable of delivering 1.3 megawatts of power through those four electric motors. But it's not all as glamorous, unfortunately, as Rimac supercars. We have to think about the mundane applications as well. This is my bin at home. And you'll see batteries and an electric motor, things that we don't even think about we're using batteries and electric motors for. So really from the sublime to the perhaps ridiculous, certainly less sublime, we're using batteries and electric motors everywhere. Um, I'm going to talk about batteries a lot this evening, and we're going to talk about some underpinning electrochemistry done by Faraday and his contemporaries, and again talk about these wonderful artefacts that we've got here at the Royal Institution. But to take a step forward 100 years or so uh, from Michael Faraday's work, or 200 years from Michael Faraday's work, uh, let's talk about the sort of battery that we need for an electric vehicle. As Martin said, the Faraday Institution is the UK's uh, national laboratory for battery science and engineering. And around about 2018, at the start of the Faraday Institution, we articulated a range of different targets for what batteries could do now and what we wanted them to do. And you can see they're listed up here. We want batteries to be cheaper. We want them to store more energy, but we also want them to be able to deliver that energy as quickly as possible. We want them to be safe. We want them to last for a long time. We want to use them in increasingly different environments. And so we need a wider temperature window uh, of operation. And of course, at the end of life, it's really important that we're able to recycle these batteries. And so we articulated these targets for electric vehicles. We could see that the lithium-ion battery of 2018 was a pretty impressive bit of kit, but there was a long way to go in terms of trying to design batteries for different applications and maybe thinking about different chemistries and how they can contribute to making cheaper batteries or lighter weight batteries or batteries that are intrinsically safer. And in building up that portfolio of different batteries, we can effectively match make them with different applications, from electric aerospace to electric vehicles to mega packs that support grid-scale energy storage. There is no shortage of opportunity for energy storage. And later on in the lecture, we're going to take a view into how we can start a, sort of tackling some of these targets. I'm going to pause for some water, and I need to be really careful because we've got all this kit in front of us, and I'm petrified about damaging any of the artefacts, Charlotte, but I'm also petrified not to pick up some zinc sulfate by accident. So I think this is... Dan, I think this is the right glass. Let's keep... Yeah, fingers crossed. If I keel over... You know why. Right, so let's think about lithium-ion batteries, because those are the ubiquitous batteries that we all almost certainly have in our pockets, on our wrists, in our cars. The development timeline of lithium-ion batteries goes a little bit like this. In the 1970s, work done by people like John Goodenough and Stan Whittingham discovered some of the fundamental materials. Over the course of the next decade, they were developed into prototype cells and commercialized by Sony in the early 1990s. And they were mostly for applications in consumer electronics. Those building blocks that we're now using for wind energy farm storages actually started life powering camcorders and discmans and other 
1990s consumer electronics items. Through the course of the 90s, the technology matured, and now we're in the era of the gigafactory. Of course, the big drive for battery production is the electrification of the transport sector. But they'll be able to contribute to all areas of net zero, and we'll see how that can happen as we move through today's lecture. But that journey from the 70s to the era of the Gigafactory, and in fact later in 2019 to the award of the Nobel Prize, that took 40 years. And we can't wait that long for the next battery to come along. We've got the ban on the sale of combustion vehicles in 2030. We've got ambitious targets for net zero by 2040 and 2050. If we want the next generation of batteries to come along, we really need to accelerate this pipeline from the discovery of new chemistries and new materials, their translation into devices, their adoption and deployment with industry. And that's really a cornerstone of the Faraday Institution, which, as I mentioned, was set up in 2017 as the UK's National Research Lab for Battery Science and Engineering. And it's tackling challenges from across the battery spectrum, from understanding how lithium-ion batteries work today, to developing entirely new chemistries, the portfolio activities that the Faraday Institution supports is really tackling and chipping away at all of those different targets and different ways to make cheaper, safer, more energy dense, more power dense batteries. And you'll see that in the Faraday Institution there's a portfolio of options. So we've got current generations of lithium ion batteries. We want to make these guys last for longer. We want to make them as safe as possible. We also want to think about how we can take some of these components that go into a current generation of lithium-ion battery cell. So this is some material that's come out of a lithium-ion battery here. How we can tweak this and make it better. How we can increase the voltage window. How we can increase the capacity of these materials. All the while doing this in a safe and sustainable way. And the second major research stream is thinking about what comes after lithium ion. What about lithium sulfur? What about sodium ion? What about metal air and solid state batteries? That portfolio of possible options, and we'll explore some various different options about how we can cherry pick the right battery for the right job later on, is really at the heart of the work of the Faraday Institution. So let's take a step back and think about how a battery works. I've got all these props in front of me, but a common theme to most of what we're looking at here is that they have the same three components. They have an anode, they have a cathode, and they have an electrolyte. So there's some jargon, and it's appropriate to use the jargon here today because those terms were coined by Michael Faraday from the work that he did in this very building. So all batteries need the same basic three components, anode, cathode, and electrolyte. And it doesn't matter if it's a lithium-ion battery or a lead-acid battery or a sodium-ion battery, they're all the same things. And there's no shortage of things to think about when we're trying to match make different chemistries together in order to come up with a battery. And um, if we uh, look on this slide, we can see what the chemists and the electrochemists describe as the standard reduction potential series. So the standard reduction potential series on the right-hand side is a long list of equations. Those equations give us the reduction and the oxidation reactions that can happen with a range of different chemicals. So, for example, when we look in front of us here, we've got some uh, copper in copper sulfate and some zinc in zinc sulfate, and we've got an anode and a cathode, and the electrolyte is the liquid. And in putting those together in something called the Daniel cell, we've now got a voltage of 1.1 volts. And again, it's an appropriate thing to be demonstrating here in this very lecture theatre, because John Frederick Daniel, after whom the Daniel cell is named, actually delivered the Faraday Institution, forgive me, the Royal Institution Christmas Lecture in 1840. So Frederick, John Frederick Daniel was here in 1840 doing this exact same experiment. Now, I think that electrochemists didn't get the memo when they thought about the graphic design of the standard reduction potential series, because you can see that the chemists have got this beautiful way of describing how the series of the elements fit together, and the electrochemists just have this sort of boring table. But in spite of that, I want to reassure you that with this boring table, we can do wonderful things, because by picking two reduction and oxidation reactions from that table, we can build such a diverse range of different batteries, from the Daniel cell that you can see here, to the voltaic pile, to the lithium ion batteries, like this guy, which we might put inside one of our electric vehicles. They're all based on those same three components, anode, cathode, and electrolyte. And so now we'll sort of perhaps take a view backwards to think about the work that Michael Faraday did here at the Royal Institution back in the 19th century. And in fact, we're going to cast our minds even further back when we think about the history of the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte, because archaeologists would have you believe that perhaps in 200 BC, 
people were already building batteries. About 25 years ago, an archaeological remain was dug up. It's called the Baghdad Battery, and it is an earthenware jar with two dissimilar metals. Now, no one could really work out what this thing was. It's got two dissimilar metals. That sounds like an anode and a cathode to me. It's got this big jar which could hold a liquid electrolyte. And the archaeologists scratched the head, and the best example they could come up with is maybe this was a rudimentary battery. Well, maybe, maybe not. I think the jury's out on that. It's certainly an interesting artefact. But it took a long time until we've got records of people purposefully trying to build batteries and to store energy. And in fact, the first purposefully designed uh, energy storage system wasn't a battery at all. It was a capacitor. And this was the Leiden jar that was built in Holland in 1745 and acted like an electrical capacitor. So it stored short bursts of energy that could be delivered in bright sparks with high power delivery. So it was an interesting science experiment, but not super practical. And it took another 50 or so years for another leap of uh, imagination to happen, which happened in a rather unexpected way when Luigi Galvani made some interesting observations with frog soup. So the apocryphal tale is the Luigi Galvani and his wife sit down for dinner uh, and they're eating frog soup and they're part of the gentry so their cutlery is made from a brass fork and a silver spoon and in trying to pin down the frog's leg and eat their frog's leg soup they saw the muscle spasm and twitch and the frog's leg jumped. And this was quite a curious thing that people didn't understand. And it led Galvani to think, well, maybe there's some intrinsic animal electricity that is stored inside us. And maybe that's what's leading to this twitch of the frog's leg. Now, he wasn't right, but we'll come back to that later on. Because using frogs was a pretty commonplace thing at the dawn of the age of electricity. People didn't have ways of measuring the electrical energy that's stored in systems. And so they used animals. And actually, worse than that, they use humans. Famously, Luigi Galvani's nephew tried to reanimate the corpse of a recently deceased criminal using some voltaic-type apparatus with dissimilar metals. I don't think he was successful, but you can see why Mary Shelley got the idea for Dr. Frankenstein, because people were literally conducting these experiments trying to reanimate corpses. Now, Luigi Galvani, as I say, was barking up the wrong tree with animal electricity, but he certainly wasn't alone in his use of frogs for his experiments. And Humphrey Davy, who was the director of the Royal Institution, actually commissioned a froggery in this very building to breed frogs for the purposes of scientific experiments. And from the 1800s, maybe up to about 1830, frogs were routinely used in scientific experiments, including public demonstration lectures uh, in this very lecture theatre. And, you know, why break with tradition? And so this evening, Dan, if we could maybe just bring out the frogs, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, go carefully. He's a slippery one, I believe. Now, of course, it's not a real-life frog, but excellent, excellent acting there, Daniel. <laughs> this is a... An, an ex-frog, a deceased frog, but one that was used as part of an experiment here at the Royal Institution. So you can see that this frog has been bred in the froggery. Unfortunately, it's been decapitated because you need a fresh frog when you're doing your experiments. So people would, you know, bring the frog and a mallet, kill it live on stage, and then attach some electrodes, which Dan is just in the middle of making here, in order to demonstrate the principles of electricity. So here we've got a skinned, decapitated frog who gave his life for science in the way that many frogs did around the 1830s before the wonderful inventions that Michael Faraday made, like the voltameter. And we're actually really delighted to have a number of artefacts here from the Royal Institution collection, including Michael Faraday's very own voltameter, which he developed in order to be able to quantify the amount of electricity that was coming from these new electrochemical cells that they were building. And it's described in beautiful detail in his famous notebooks, which you can see here. Now, the other artefact that I've got in front of me is really kind of the holy grail for many electrochemists, because this is the voltaic pile. But it's not just any voltaic pile. It is the voltaic pile that Alessandro Volta gave to Michael Faraday and Humphrey Davy in 1813. And you can see that the voltaic pile here is made up of different disks of zinc and copper and zinc and copper. And they've been separated by some filter paper which is soaked in an electrolyte solution. And Alessandro Volta developed these voltaic piles 
in order to illustrate that actually Luigi Galvani's assumption about animal electricity was intrinsically wrong. The frog's leg wasn't twitching because of anything to do with it being an organic creature. It was because you've got two dissimilar metals, the silver spoon and the brass fork, separated by some electrolyte, which in that case was the frog's leg. In this case, it's some filter paper soaked in water. Now, I'm not going to do an experiment with this one, Charlotte, don't worry, but busily building away in the corner. Thank you very much, Dan. We have got a voltaic pile that uh, Dan has built there, and here's one that we made earlier as well. We can see that in stacking these up, I've got 2.3 volts on my voltaic pile. What, what did you manage to get on yours, Dan? Let's, uh, let's have a look. Zero volts. They do work, I promise. <laughs> Can we get something? Is anyone in? I saw a 13 there. I'm sure I saw a 13. Anyway, you can see that this principle of voltaic piles sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, but it's got two dissimilar metals, our anode, our cathode, and our electrolyte, and we can build them up to make voltages, which in this case is two volts, but I know that when we practiced this earlier, we got about 16 volts, so I know, I know that we can get to reasonably high voltages. And this is exactly what Alessandro Volta did. Now, we're using a voltmeter here. We've got a voltmeter connected up to our Daniel cell, giving about a volt. We've got about 2.2 volts on our voltaic pile. But ironically, when Volta was doing his experiments, he had no way of quantifying the electricity that he was creating in his voltaic pile with his repeat units of anodes, cathodes, and electrolytes. And so, given that he had no way of measuring it, he had to resort to something quite extreme. And he used his body in order to try and judge how much electricity he was demonstrating. So he wasn't a Philistine. He didn't use frogs like Luigi Galvani. He suffered in, in, you know, for his science personally. And he describes in the scientific literature the following phenomena. He's building voltaic piles, and he's saying that by touching the fifth, sixth, and the rest of the electrodes in succession, it's curious to observe how the shocks gradually increase in force. I receive from a column formed of 20 pairs of these pieces, the electrodes, shocks which affect the whole finger with considerable pain. So he really was suffering for his science, just like these poor frogs. But he goes on to describe the most weird and wonderful things because he would take the battery, a voltaic pile very similar to this, and he would make really large voltaic piles and connect them to his eyeballs. And he'd see a flash of electricity and he'd pass out and then get back and write up his notebooks and say, you know, 6 a.m., woke up, feeling a bit sore, must have passed out after last night's experiment. So he really did suffer for his science. But Michael Faraday was a smart cookie, and he thought to himself, well, there must be a better way of doing this. And that's what led to the development of this, the voltameter. And we'll talk about that and maybe do a demo of something like that a little bit later on. But before we do that, let's think about what was happening to poor old Alessandro Volta. He was basically giving himself a small electrical shock. And this is the bit that I really hate, Dan, because this is a bit, this a stupid thing that everyone's done, is they've taken a nine volt battery, and they, oh, it's horrible. Ah, got, got a tiny little tingling shock when you stick that battery onto your tongue. Now, you'll think you don't get a shock when you stick it onto your skin, but you do get a shock uh, when you stick it onto your tongue. And the reason for that is because the resistance of your skin is so much higher than the resistance of your tongue. So I reckon that when I stick it on my skin, you know, a rough calculation probably means I'm getting 0.1 milliamp roughly when I... Uh, stick it on my skin, but probably about 1.3 milliamps when I stick it on my tongue. Now, that's what gives you that tingling sensation, that unpleasant tingling sensation. But with Alessandro Volta building his great big voltaic piles, and how much have we got here, Dan? I think, well, I think we've got enough. We've got 16 volts. So if you can just pop that on your eyeball, that would be brilliant. No? Okay. But what Alessandro Volta was describing was that he was probably getting voltaic piles up to about 90 volts. And with 90 volts, you're probably going to be passing currents of 10 to 20 milliamps. And we now know from modern medicine that that will lead to involuntary muscle contractions, very much like the ones he was describing. Make a pile a little bit too big by accident, and you're right on the border of paralysis and heart stoppage. So these guys really did suffer for their science. But, all right, let's try out. Let's try out and see. We can prove to everyone that it really does work. So what am I doing? Red on the bottom. Red on the bottom one. Yeah, where, yeah, uh, there's there the go. terminal there. There we go. Look at that. So we, we can get these things to work. And I think this is very fitting because we're talking about Frankenstein, weren't we? And that, yeah. looks, that looks slightly Frankenstein-like to me as well. Um, 
But as I was saying, Michael Faraday is not, you know, he's not content with uh, killing all these frogs in their hundreds and thousands, and he's certainly not going to stick a terminal onto his eyeball. And so when he was doing experiments with the voltaic pile, he actually thought of a better way of quantifying the amount of electricity, and the, fil the field of voltammetry was born. And this wonderful artifact from the Royal Institution Collection illustrates, along with Michael Faraday's notebooks, the experiments that he did in order to quantify the amount of voltage that we can develop from the various different voltaic piles and Daniel cells that we've seen on the table. And it's quite ingenious because what it does is Michael Faraday recognised that when we apply a voltage to some water, it will split that water into hydrogen and oxygen. And if you can measure the amount of hydrogen and oxygen that's coming off, the quantity of that will tell you how much current has been passed or how much charge has been passed. And that led to the development of Faraday's law. You can also, and I think if we look at this uh, apparatus here, we can also get an indication of the voltage of a system. If you can see the bubbles there, when I crank the voltage up, it starts to bubble much more quickly. So this simple apparatus that is Faraday's voltameter can give us an indication via the amount of hydrogen produced that tells us how much charge has been passed and via the rate of bubble production the amount of voltage so up at 18 25 volts we can see that the hydrogen is really starting to bubble quite quickly and so this ingenious invention was one of many contributions that Michael Faraday made to the field of electrochemistry and I think that we've really been standing on the shoulders of giants in the development of uh, energy storage ever since. Um, and the Royal Institution continues to push frontiers of course. Just five years ago uh, here in this very lecture theatre there was a world record attempt for a record breaking battery building something extremely similar to the Daniel cell but this time using lemons. So you've probably all done in a school science classroom a lemon battery experiment you take a lemon you get a zinc nail and a copper penny and you can make a battery but Saif al-Islam who is a good friend and colleague and gave the Christmas lectures back in 2016 wasn't content with just one of these he had the poor Royal Institution staff cutting lemons overnight they cut about 8,000 Martin is that right it seemed like 8,000 I'm sure about you know about an awful lot of batteries and they got to more than a thousand volts I think about 1250 volt battery that they're able to demonstrate just behind these doors so the Royal Institution continues to push frontiers but of course lemon batteries are not particularly practical I sort of did a rough back of the envelope calculation and I think if you want to power a Jaguar I-Pace using lemon batteries you need about 1.6 million of them so let's stick to lithium-ion batteries for now and we're going to switch gears and talk in a bit more detail about these guys these lithium-ion batteries which we all use so much in our day-to-day -day lives so before we get stuck into what we're going to do next let's think about what we've got so in a lithium-ion battery the black box in the back of your mobile phone what are the materials in there well we can see some of the materials because we've got some of them here so if we take a cylindrical cell like the ones that might go into a battery like this they're exactly the same as the one that goes into my bike and my vacuum cleaner we can sort of unroll this and you can see that packed into that little cylinder are these long strips of material this is a graphite anode it's our negative electrode in a lithium-ion battery and it accepts lithium when we charge the battery our positive electrode, sometimes called our cathode, is normally made out of a lithium-containing metal oxide material. And these batteries are sometimes called rocking chair batteries because when we charge and discharge a lithium-ion battery, what happens is we're effectively moving lithium ions from one electrode to the other, backwards and forwards, hundreds of times as we charge and discharge our battery. So they're quite simple, mundane-looking materials on the face of it. Graphite is the same stuff that you have in pencil lead. But as we'll see later on, some really fantastic things happen when we operate these things in batteries. And I wanted to uh, sort of just recognise the, uh, the sort of pioneers of the lithium-ion battery. For example, John Goodenough, uh, who is uh, a very uh, famous material scientist, who discovered some of the fundamental materials that are the building blocks of lithium-ion batteries, even to this very day. And as an inspiration for us all, I wanted to play this video clip, because he says, as we will hear, I hope, I'm only 92 years old... I've got plenty of life left in me yet. Yeah, I mean, I'm only 92. I've got time to go.
He laughs. He's got the most fantastic laugh in the whole world. And he's a, a wonderful scientist and a wonderful human. But he says, I'm only 92 years old. There's still plenty of life in me yet. And he's right, because he's still publishing very actively today. And about six years after that clip was recorded with that fantastic laugh, he was awarded the Nobel Prize along with Whittingham and Yoshino, who, recognized, who were recognised for their contributions in the development of the lithium-ion battery. So we've got good enough from Whittingham, who developed some of the underpinning materials that go into the batteries that we still use to this day and Yoshino who was able to develop these into prototype cells and you can see one of those prototype cells on the right hand side of this slide and you might think to yourself well actually that doesn't look hugely different to some of the apparatus that we've got here on the bench you've got all those same fundamental components a liquid electrolyte a solid cathode and a solid anode and with our chemical reactions that happen at each of the electrodes a redox reaction a reduction and an oxidation reaction that's the building blocks of all these batteries, whether you've got something that is made out of lemons or something that's made out of lithium. But you'll see when we're talking about lithium-ion batteries, there's one thing that is generally missing from rechargeable lithium-ion batteries, and that's metallic lithium. We don't have any metallic lithium typically in lithium-ion batteries. And the reason for that is maybe not what you think. We know that lithium is very, very reactive. We know it's very, very flammable. And the internet is awash with people doing stupid things, like this guy who's decided to take some lithium, set fire to it, and drop it in water. And of course it burns. Is there any surprise it burns? But I point out to my undergraduates when I give this lecture, Think about the IQ of this chap because he has decided to do this whilst wearing flip flops. So, not only has he not got safety specs and goggles on and he's burning lithium metals, he's making fireworks in his back garden right next to his next door neighbor's house whilst wearing flip flops. So, yes, if you take lithium and you put it on fire and you chuck it into a bucket of water, bad things will happen. But that's not the reason that we don't use them in lithium ion batteries. Flammability is something that can be managed, risk can be managed. When we drive around in a regular combustion vehicle, we're sitting on top of a large tank of flammable liquid. It's not surprising that when you burn lithium, something like that happens. The actual reason we don't use lithium as an electrode within a lithium-ion battery is more associated with the reversibility of the electrochemical reactions at each electrode. If we have a lithium metal electrode, we might describe the reaction during recharge of that lithium uh, electrode as being somewhat irreversible. And that somewhat irreversible reaction leads to the development of something called dendrites. The lithium doesn't go back where you want it to go back. And that's true of lithium metal electrodes. It's true of many metallic electrodes. If we were to take a voltaic pile and discharge it in order to power Dan's Frankenstein eyes, then it works. But if we try and recharge it, it becomes much more difficult. And that's what I'm going to try and illustrate with this next demonstration. If we could possibly switch over to the visualizer, what you can see here, I'll put my specs on, is an anode, a cathode, and some electrolytes. So we've got a copper electrode, a zinc electrode, and some electrolyte, exactly the same as the setup in a voltaic pile. But now, rather than trying to discharge the battery, I'm going to put some energy in and try and attempt to recharge the battery. And what I hope you can see in this video is with growing these dendrites, the copper electrode is not behaving in a reversible way. The zinc is placing onto that electrode and those dendrites are growing and growing and they're getting thicker and thicker. And this indicates the electrochemical irreversibility of the reaction. You can also hopefully just about see some bubbles that are just rising up there as we begin to electrolyze some of the water. We're creating some hydrogen by splitting the water, which is a solvent for our zinc sulfate, into hydrogen and oxygen. That, of course, is the basis for Faraday's... Oh, there we go. I knew that was coming and it still gives me a heart attack. And that was the basis for Michael Faraday's electrical voltameter. And I can tell that I'm not the only one who had a heart attack because Charlotte, who's the curator here at the Royal Institution, has just had to watch me blow up pyrotechnics next to her priceless artifacts. But I think we got away with it, Charlotte, so I'm, I'm pleased with that. So what happened there was we were growing dendrites between our copper electrode and our zinc electrode. We were trying to recharge the voltaic pile, but because it's a somewhat irreversible electrochemical reaction, it doesn't recharge in a nice way. And over time, those dendrites grow and eventually it short-circuited the cell. And I should give a disclaimer there that we put a small pyrotechnic in, in the series of that circuit, so when it short-circuited, it gave a nice little explosion and made my heart jump, but we didn't destroy any of the artifacts, I'm pleased to see. So if we could maybe switch back to the power PowerPoint presentation. That's exactly what happens if we use lithium metal electrodes at high current densities in liquid electrolytes. 
Here's another video with a more microscopic view of the experiment that we've just seen. And you can see these beautiful dendritic branches that begin to grow out from our metal electrodes when we attempt to recharge the battery. And so we've got some ideas about how we might use lithium metal electrodes, but probably not with liquid electrolytes, probably with solid state batteries. We're going to talk about solid state batteries in a few slides time. Before we get onto that, though, let's think about the other stuff that's in an electrode. So we don't use lithium metal, we put the lithium with other bits and pieces, like lithium cobalt oxide, which was one of the materials that John Goodenough discovered in the late 1970s, or like graphite that comes from our pencil lead, the graphite that we could see in this cell just here. And this is literally just the same sort of black powder that you might expect to get from pencil lead. But they're packaged up really nicely together into these really well-engineered devices um, in order to deliver energy. But something quite unexpected happens with graphite. You can see on the left-hand side, we've got our lithium cobalt oxide. That's our positive electrode material. On the right-hand side, we've got our graphite electrode. That's our negative electrode. And as we charge and discharge this otherwise dull gray material, something quite wonderful happens. It begins to change color. And actually, we can use this as an indication of how charged our battery is. If you've got black graphite, your battery is discharged. When it starts to go blue and then red and eventually gold, as you can see on the screen, a gold battery is good, you've got a fully charged battery. So these batteries which we use every day really are a black box because there's this wonderful complex chemistry that's happening inside the batteries in the back of our phones and we don't even think about it. We totally take it for granted. Now, when we've got these batteries here, a bit like we sort of see in a university research lab, under very controlled conditions, we often take them to pieces in order to investigate those materials. But in an ideal world, we don't want to be the coroner and carve up a battery after it's died. We want to be the diagnostic doctor and investigate that battery during its operating life. And we want to understand how these complicated materials behave as we charge and discharge them, as we try and take them to extreme temperatures or extreme uh, charge and discharge rates. And in order to do that, we use a lot of similar um, phenomena that medical doctors use. We use MRIs, we use X-rays, we take the temperature of the battery, we listen to it, we use acoustic and ultrasound sensors in order to understand what's going on. And I hope that that's illustrated in this uh, short video which is uh, made using some of our three-dimensional X-ray imaging tools which we use to see inside batteries. Now, of course, when we've got these big dummy batteries like this, it's easy to see inside them, but inside a real working cell, when you're often dealing with nano-sized materials, trying to understand exactly what's going on during operation is pretty tricky. And so we use CAT scanners, X-ray computed tomography scanners, very similar to those that are in hospitals. The ones that we use in the laboratory would be deadly to a patient, but they give us this spectacularly high resolution so we can see in really microscopic detail exactly what's going on with these materials during operation. And here we've got a three-dimensional picture where on the left-hand side we've got a three-dimensional image of our cathode, and on the right-hand side we've got a three-dimensional image of our anode. And that boring old graphite powder suddenly looks quite interesting because it's such a complex and heterogeneous material. And actually the nature and the morphology of that material will really dictate how the battery behaves. You change the graphite in your electrode and your phone might stop working. You make it better and you might be able to charge it more quicker or less often. And so being able to understand and optimise these materials is really at the heart of being able to engineer better batteries. And we do that with a broad range of characterization and modelling tools, such as the numerical simulations of lithium and electron flow that we saw in that video. So that's where we are today. That's the lithium-ion battery that we have in our phones, in our laptops, in our vacuum cleaners, in our electric vehicles. But where are we going next? Well, at the very beginning, I said that in 2018, we thought about a bunch of targets for electric vehicle batteries. And there were eight targets. Cost, energy density, power density, safety, first life, temperature, predictability, and recyclability. And they're all extremely important, but today I thought I'd just cherry-pick four of them to talk about some investigations that we've done in order to try and improve cost, energy, safety, and the durability of batteries. So let's, let's start with safety. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. If you look on Twitter, you might think that you're going to end up with a battery catching fire in your pocket, but it is extremely unlikely. 
with the data that we have available, the best estimates are that the risk of battery failure is about 1 in 40 million. So the chances of it happening to any vid individual are extremely low. However, of course, we want to understand the phenomena that could lead to battery failure, so we can engineer, in, engineer intrinsically safe batteries. And I mentioned that we do a lot of X-ray imaging, and one thing we do is X-ray batteries while we're purposefully blowing them up. And I was delighted, actually, because the press picked up on this investigation, and they called us British boffins who blew up batteries and filmed the melting copper. And, uh, you know, I, was, I thought a badge of honour to be called a British boffin, so uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that specific experiment. So this definitely comes with a health warning. Do not try this experiment at home. It was done under very controlled laboratory conditions. But what we did was we took a battery like this, and on purpose, we drove a very hard electrical short circuit. When we drove that very hard electrical short circuit, we can see using our really high-speed X-ray cameras inside the battery and interrogate what happens to the battery during that failure event. And I should come back to that idea that the chances of this happening to you are extremely slim. One in 40 million batteries fail, and they don't fail most of the time as spectacularly as this one. But when they do fail, we want to understand what's going on. And we want to understand the speed at which that failure propagates. You can see in the top left-hand corner, we've got a timestamp. It says 1.285 seconds at the beginning, and it says 1.3 seconds at the end of the video. So this is a super high-speed X-ray image. It happens over about 15 milliseconds that we have an operating battery to a battery that has completely failed. But as I say, this is something that is rare and is unlikely to happen to you. But in order to develop batteries that are intrinsically fail-safe, we now have another tool in order to interrogate batteries. So, for example, another stupid experiment that definitely comes with the health warning is called the nail penetration test. The nail penetration test does exactly what it says on the tin. You take a nail and you drive it into the side of the battery. Please, please, please do not try this at home. The explosions are understandably spectacular when you do something like that. However, when you think about how to re-engineer a battery, maybe we can think about new components that go into an existing lithium-ion battery that might make it safer. By taking some of the metallic components, which have high electrical conductivity, out of the cell and replacing them with plastic components, maybe we can develop new cells which have a much greater uh, a much greater sort of safety performance. And that's exactly what we did, using polymer-based current collectors in replacing the otherwise metal-based current collectors. We're able to do these stupid things, like drive nails through the sides of cells, but not cause an explosion. Rather remarkably, if you can just about make out on this voltmeter, we're reading about 4.1 volts for a battery that we have purposefully driven a nail through the side of it. And this is really quite remarkable. So the characterization tools that we now have at our disposal are enabling us to road test completely new designs for lithium-ion batteries and next-generation batteries, like solid-state batteries. We talked about the irreversibility of some electrochemical uh, reactions in liquid solutions. And we saw in that dendrite experiment that the dendrite could grow from one electrode to the other, eventually leading to a short circuit. But what if we stick a solid barrier in between it? Well, that's pretty much what a solid-state battery does. It first of all replaces our liquid electrolyte with a solid that can still conduct lithium ions, but it also provides a physical barrier that can prevent, hopefully, the penetration of dendrites through the material. And so solid-state batteries offer great promise in order for us to develop intrinsically safe batteries, because we're removing flammable components and making the battery more energy dense. But unfortunately, it's not a done deal, because even though we're putting a solid layer in between our two electrodes, which everyone thought would block that dendrite, you can see, again using some really high-resolution microscopy tools, that the lithium is able to work its way through the tiny crystallographic grain boundaries within our solid-state electrolyte, and eventually, these dendrites can still grow through a solid if you use really high current densities. So again, the Faraday Institution Solbat program is developing new materials and new engineering approaches to try and tackle this challenge so we can have higher energy density and safer solid-state batteries. The next target I want to talk about is energy density. So we've talked a lot about lithium-ion batteries, and they have 
best-in-class energy density. And they're based on these sorts of materials, the graphite materials that we can see here, which actually get printed on a machine that looks a little bit like a newspaper printing press. In these large gigafactories, which are hugely impressive, highly automated uh, bits of uh, manufacturing technology, we're still using roll-to-roll -roll printing to make these electrodes. And if you open up pretty much any of these batteries, these lithium-ion batteries that I've got on the table in front of me, you'll find that there is a finite thickness to these battery electrodes, which is probably about 100 microns, about the width of one of your eyelashes, is about how thick this material is. And the reason that we've come to that thickness as the engineered optimum for a battery electrode is because we are trading off the energy density and the power density of our battery. We could make a thicker electrode, but it would take so long to charge and discharge that it wouldn't deliver us any useful power. But what if we can re-engineer the manufacturing processes so rather than doing roll-to-roll -roll printing like in a newspaper printing press, we're doing something a bit more sophisticated. And that could range from spray deposition to really sophisticated three-dimensional printing. That means that we could design entirely new architectures that could pack more material in, giving us higher energy density, without compromising the power density of the cell. And so the Faraday Institute's next road programme is tackling that exact problem. Let's make thicker electrodes so we can pack more stuff into our battery and hopefully improve the energy density. But that's only one approach. Of course, we can look again to next generation post-lithium-ion chemistries, like lithium sulphur. And the lithium sulphur chemistry is a really exciting technology, particularly because it is intrinsically very, very lightweight. A good lithium-ion battery has an energy storage capacity of about 250 watt-hours per kilogram. A good lithium sulphur battery has an energy storage capacity of more than 400 watt-hours per kilogram. So we're almost doubling the energy stored per unit weight. And for things that fly, like my drone, or maybe like a large-scale uh, civil aircraft, having batteries that are really lightweight could be a complete game-changer for the decarbonisation of the aerospace sector. Let's talk about cost. Cost is important for everyone. Some applications are particularly cost sensitive, but everyone cares about cost on some level. The cost of lithium ion batteries has come down quite significantly in recent years. And you hear about gigafactories, and that scale of production is one of the reasons that the cost has come down so much. But electric vehicles are still expensive. We need to make them cheaper, and we need to reduce the cost of the cell. One way to do this is to think about the intrinsic materials that go into all of these lithium-ion batteries that I've got in front of me. There is a list of critical elements that is maintained which describe the scarcity of different elements on the periodic table. If we look inside a lithium-ion battery, we find a number of them. We find nickel, we find graphite, we find cobalt. And cobalt is not only expensive as a component of a battery chemistry, but it is also very difficult to sustainably source. And so the route to low or maybe even no cobalt will provide an opportunity not just to reduce the cost of batteries, but also to improve the overall sustainability of batteries. And we're already doing a great job on this. If you bought a mobile phone 10 years ago, the chances are that it will be a lithium cobalt oxide battery. So that would be the chemical formula LiCoO2. However, if I buy a battery like this today, about 90% of the cobalt has already been removed. And it's been replaced with other elements like nickel uh, and manganese. And so we've already made great leaps in terms of reducing the amount of cobalt, but we still need to go further. And through the Faraday Institution's Future Cat and CatMap programmes, we're looking at next generation lithium ion cathode chemistries. And also through the LiStar programme, maybe we can get rid of cobalt altogether and go straight to a chemistry like sodium ion or lithium sulphur, which is entirely cobalt free. And the final challenge that I want to talk about uh, is the durability of a battery. When you've got a mobile phone battery, after a couple of years, you've charged and discharged it a couple of hundred times, maybe 700 times over two years, and you know that it begins to fade. It's getting late, it's nearly eight o'clock. Some of you will be looking at that percentage dial on your battery and thinking it's getting a bit low. That's a bit frustrating, but I'll be home soon and I can plug it in. But obviously for batteries in mission-critical applications, whether that's in electric vehicles or in aerospace or in 
stationary energy storage, it's not acceptable to have batteries that degrade to the point where they can't be used. And so understanding degradation is really extremely important. And the Faraday Institution Degradation Project is trying to do exactly that. When we think about battery degradation, the consequences and the impact are at the device level, when my vacuum cleaner no longer switches on. But the causes of that degradation are really at the atomic level. And so we're developing some of the world's most sophisticated microscopy, spectroscopy, and analytical tools in order to be able to probe at the finest possible length scales where every atom in the battery is and whether it's behaving or misbehaving. And by understanding that atomistic level of the chemistry occurring within our operating lithium-ion batteries, we're able to strike at the heart as to why these batteries degrade in the first place. And so I hope that I've shown that over the sort of portfolio of the Faraday Institution projects, we are able to begin to chip away at these various metrics, thinking about batteries like sodium ion and lithium sulfur, which are low cost, thinking about replacing components in current generation technologies and next generation energy dense technologies like lithium sulfur and lithium air, thinking about capacitive materials that may give us really high power density, and thinking about materials like solid state batteries, which are intrinsically much safer. And all of these things have to be made mass manufacturable, recyclable, durable, cheaply, sustainably and ethically sourced. And so we've got our work cut out because the lithium ion battery is really a wonderful technology. The evidence for that is all around us. They're completely ubiquitous. But as we begin to develop a more diverse portfolio of batteries, as I mentioned, we can effectively match make those batteries with the right application. Lightweight batteries for things that fly. Long life batteries for things that go into energy storage farms. But we have a rocky road because I think this diagram, which sort of shows the roller coaster ride from the discovery of a battery technology to its commercial deployment, shows that this journey is very difficult. It took 40 years, as we discussed, for the battery, the lithium ion battery, to go from a laboratory discovery through to a commodity product. In order to achieve net zero, we can't wait 40 years. And so we need to accelerate the development of these technologies as fast as possible. And we need to smooth out this roller coaster ride and watch out for the trough of disillusionment and hope we can get to the slope of enlightenment as quickly as possible. Anyway, those are some options that we've got, but what we've got today is the lithium ion battery. And we really are in the era of the gigafactory. The gigafactory was a, uh, a term that was coined by everyone's favourite bat battery evangelist, Elon Musk, and a gigafactory is one that is capable of producing a gigawatt hour of capacity per year. And to put that into context, that's one billion of these batteries, or at least the energy stored in one billion of these batteries. So these are enormous undertakings, and you can see here a rendering of the Tesla gigafactory that is currently being built in Berlin. And if we look around Europe, there is a huge proliferation on the development and the deployment of gigafactories. And the Faraday Institution estimates that we're going to go from about 50 gigawatt hours of production in Europe in 2021 to about 450, 500 gigawatt hours over the course of the next decade. So we're almost exponentially growing, an order of magnitude in the next decade in terms of the installed capacity. And the UK is no exception to this. For the UK automotive sector alone, we need to be installing gigafactories at a pretty significant rate of knots because the Faraday Institution, in their estimates, think that we need about seven gigafactories by 2040 just to service the UK automotive sector. And so we're delighted that there are a number of announcements for gigafactories in the UK, but I think in order to stay competitive, we need to continue to drive the domestic manufacturing of both lithium-ion batteries and post-lithium-ion batteries, because there's no shortage of opportunities for energy storage. But as with so many things, the Royal Institution was in many ways here first, because Back in 1807, the Royal Institution could really be considered to be the gigafactory of its time. They were churning out so many of these cells like this to service the scientific needs of Humphrey Davy and Michael Faraday and their colleagues. And at the time, there was a bit of a competition in terms of who could build the biggest battery. But I think Humphrey Davy was up there in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of that competition because he assembled this really large battery based on these Cruikshank cells. Uh, 
uh, both here at the Royal Institution and at the London Institute. And he did wonderful things with these batteries. He was electrolyzing everything, left, right, and center. It's how he isolated potassium from potash. And so the Royal Institution was really ahead of the curve because they were building these gigafactories a long time ago. Now, many of you will have noticed that bubbling away here in the uh, lecture theater has been a uh, electrolyzer apparatus. We've got a power supply rather than one of our crude shank cells, but it is happily bubbling away, producing hydrogen. It is demonstrating exactly the same principles that Michael Faraday used for his voltameter by splitting the water in this vessel into hydrogen and oxygen in this vessel, we can see the current and the voltage can be monitored. And no Royal Institution lecture would be complete without going out with a bang. So, Dan, maybe we can just have a little play and see how much hydrogen we've got here. I haven't got my calculator with me to sort of do the Faraday's law calculation, but maybe we can measure the sound that we're going to get, hopefully, from this bang. We're going to go with volume. I'm going to pop these on, and I'm not going to be able to hear a single thing. So let's... Uh, Good, you don't want to know what's going on. I'll see you on the other side, I think, cool. yeah. Um, so um, we're going to blow up a bit of hydrogen and oxygen from here, um, possibly in Paul's hand. We're putting these on because there is a possibility this will be quite loud. Sometimes it's a nice gentle pop, but sometimes it's quite loud. So I am going to ask you to cover your ears, just in case it's one of the loud ones today. So uh, I've got to go He's going to do this in my hand. Don't worry about your ears. It's my hand that I'm your worried hand, yeah, about. It's a, yeah, yeah, OK, let's, thanks. Let's, you, know, you don't need them, right? So um, to capture the gas, I'm going to put a bit of soapy water into Paul's hand. So let's go fill that up nicely there. There we go. I'm going to turn the voltage right up so we get loads of bubbles coming out of there. And we're going to bubble that through that soapy water. We'll uh, make sure we put lots of bubbles into Paul's hands. So there's lots of hydrogen and oxygen in there. Thank Very you. Very important <laughs> I don't get distracted and forget what I'm doing and put too much hydrogen in there or too much oxygen. That'd be awful if that happened, wouldn't it? I'm glad I can't hear any of this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's nothing important. It's nothing important. Um, the voltaic pile was good, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, it was nice. Charlotte's going to be very upset if we break it there. You know, no, I think we've looked after it all right. I think it's OK. <laughs> oh, sorry. OK, right. So um, let's pop that back in there. Please do cover your ears just in case. Paul, okay. move that nice and far away from my face. Uh, and give me a countdown, please. Three, two, one. Go. Oh. There. All right. Thank you very much. I really think we should have done that eyeball experiment, though, Dan. I think we should get your voltaic pile back up. I've got the terminals ready. Um, so, as I said, everything has been done at the Royal Institution before, from the gigafactory to the voltameter. It's such a pleasure to be here in this famous lecture theatre. And thank you so much for coming this evening to hear about Galvani to gigafactories. Before I close, and I'd be delighted to take any questions, uh, I just want to thank a few people, uh, in particular from UCL. I'd like to thank Toby, Hugh and Mike, who were great in helping setting up the demos. And here at the Royal Institution, Dan, who you've met, but also Martin, uh, Charlotte and Mike, and the rest of the Royal Institution institution and UCL teams. Thank you to the Faraday Institution who sponsored this evening's uh, event. Uh, and as I say, I'm just so delighted to be here lecturing not only in this wonderful building, but also doing it in person. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great pleasure and I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you.